the year is 1609, and an Englishman named Henry Hudson has been hired by the Dutch to find a northeast passage over the top of Asia. And for one reason or another, he's thousands of miles in the wrong direction. On the wrong continent. In the wrong hemisphere. Henry Hudson is not a stupid man. So what is he doing? I'm willing to bet that most of this episode will take place at sea. So the background noise is going to be the ocean waves moving in and out. Henry Hudson lived at a very interesting time. Especially if you're interested in things like genealogy and you've constructed family trees. There's a certain point where you go back far enough and unless your relative was some sort of duke or lord or king, the records just start to disappear. And Henry Hudson lives at that moment. He lives at that time where ordinary people are just going to live and die without any record right around the 16th century. And then after this point, during the life of Henry Hudson, this is when we first start to see people in the historical record who aren't dukes and kings and nobles and queens and princesses or important religious figures, but they're really capable people who have accomplished amazing things because they're smart or they're very brave. So Henry Hudson's going to be part of that first generation that we remember because, not because of what's in their blood, but because who they became. But because he wasn't born anybody super important, we don't actually know the details of his early life. We don't know his exact birth date or exactly who his family was. We know his family name. But who was his father? Who exactly was his father? Who exactly was his mother? We're not exactly certain. Of course, afterwards, we do have the records. But again, he's right on the cusp of this, this moment in history where beforehand, you weren't important enough to be known. But afterwards, you were. Historians have combed records to try to find who Henry Hudson was, where he came from, what, what were his family, what businesses were they in beforehand. And it appears that there were Hudsons, or Hodgkins, or Hodgsons involved in uh, shipping, and boating, and exploring the world long before Henry Hudson. We see that there are lots of Hudsons, or Hertzons, working for the Muscovy Company out of England. That would be a company that worked with shipping between England and and, of course, Russia. And the Muscovy Company was similar to the Dutch VOC, but much smaller. And we'll see that later Henry Hudson is going to work for this company. So there is a connection there more than just a similar name. One employee of the Muscovy Company was a guy named Henry Hudson, who died around 1555. And then we see that he probably had a son named Thomas Hudson, or Christopher Hudson, or Th another Thomas Hudson. There's a very confusing records. So there, you could have two people who essentially have the same name living very close together, and you can assume it's one person. It's, it's confusing. If you've ever done genealogy, like I said before, it gets really complicated. But it is pretty certain that Hudson's family were involved in shipping and in sailing ships for a very long time. We do know that Henry Hudson, as a young man, got married to a woman named Catherine and had three sons named Oliver, John, and Richard. And Hudson will be taking some of these sons on journeys with him. Now, here's the dirty secret about the history of the United States of any country in the Americas. When we talk about our own history, we always talk about these explorers finding, you know, new parts of the new world and naming it after themselves or their queen or king and how great it was and how majestic and grand it was and then the old country celebrated. Not very much of that is true. In reality, a lot of these explorers were looking for a way around the Americas to the Orient, to China, to India, to places like that. This is going to be true for Henry Hudson, but he's not the first one in the game. This has been going on for a long time. You can even go back to Columbus. Columbus was just looking for a western passage to India and China, and he ran into the Americas. Then you have other early explorers like Magellan, who ended up finding a, a southwestern passage, which he realized, well, he died during that mission, spoiler, but basically that was such a long way to go that it really wasn't economical to go that way, but he's the one who discovered that one. So the western passage wasn't going to work. The southwestern passage was too impractical, so people started looking for a northwestern passage over the top of what we now call North America. And then there were other people who were looking for a Northeast Passage over the top of Eurasia to get to China and India. And then on top of that, there were people who were going to try to try to sail square over the top of the planet Earth. Just find a Northern Passage all the way to the other side of the planet. Many explorers try to find one of these ways, one of these passages. Henry Hudson tries to find all three. We don't need to go through every single person who tried to find the Northwest Passage. Well, one that is important in this story is Giovanni de Verrazzano, who is from the Republic of Florence, but he was working for the monarchy of Spain at the time. Almost a hundred years before Henry Hudson comes around, 
this guy actually discovers the mouth of the Hudson River and Cape Cod and the Delaware River. He discovers a lot of the East Coast for the European powers at the time. So contrary to myth, Hudson was not the first guy sailing up and down that area. And we'll talk about that a lot. There was probably a lot of people there, and they were keeping it hush-hush, and those reasons are soon to come. And Verrazano was there looking for a Northwest Passage. Again, these guys didn't want to land in the Americas. They wanted to get around the Americas. And Henry Hudson comes around late to this game. There had been now a century of people trying to find a way to Asia, and he was just a newcomer, a young guy. He's going to do four voyages in four back-to-back -back years. He becomes obsessed with the task of finding his way to Asia faster than going all the way around the Horn of Africa. And as we heard, he was not alone. So why all this, all of a sudden do we want to find a way to get there over the sea by not going south, by finding a new way, no matter how, many, how much danger is involved in it? Why all of a sudden do Europeans want to get to that part of Asia by a different way than all the ways that they know? Well, a couple things happen early on. We see the Mongols kind of fall apart. All the various empires they created, there was peace in between them and people could travel between them. That all falls apart. We see that the Byzantine Empire finally crumbles and the Turks take over and they block all the overland routes. All right. That would connect Europe and Asia through Asia Minor. All that is gone. And then, of course, in the 16th century, you see the rise of the Spanish Empire and the Portuguese. And, of course, they're laying south of all these English explorers and these Dutch explorers. And so, your southern routes are going to be dominated by Spanish traders, Spanish military, Spanish navy. Your overland routes are extremely dangerous. There's no unified political entities between your destination and yourself to guarantee your safety. And so that leaves going north, somehow. You can go square west, maybe? And we found out really early in 1492, can't really do that. You can go northeast, you can go north, you can go northwest. Those are your choices. So that's how we get to this position. Now, Henry Hudson, on his very first mission, 1607, I believe. Yeah, 1607. He decides, hey, guys, I'm going for it. I'm going straight north over the top of the North Pole to get to Asia. Now, you might think, wow, that sounds insane or that sounds stupid. I mentioned in the last episode, we're going to hear some decisions that sound stupid. But there was actually some signs at the time to suggest that maybe, although it's icy up there, maybe once you get north enough, it starts to warm up a little more. And maybe a northern passage would open up and you could just sail straight over the top of the earth, cut out thousands of miles, not have to worry about any other foreign power in your way, and trade with Asia. There were both Dutch and English scientists and map makers who thought that this could possibly be true. Because they knew of the phenomenon if you went close enough to the poles, the sun never set. So they figured, well, if you go really far north, it does get icy, and the ocean actually freezes over in icebergs and glaciers. Well, that happens because you're, you're north, but you're not north enough for the sun to not set. But they knew if you kept going north, there'd be a certain time of the year where the sun was always out. In which case, the sunlight would be really weak, but it's constant. So there might be a chance that once you make it through this really icy uh, frontier, there might be a liquid ocean toward the top of the earth now based on the science at the time it's not a bad hypothesis it needed to be tested henry hudson's going to be the guy to test it i couldn't find any research of anyone trying it before him he's the guy who's going to be crazy enough to go all right guys let's just go square north see what happens during this mission and all missions except for one he's working for an english company he's working for the muscovy company like we mentioned before because he is an englishman there's only one mission where he works for the Dutch, and that's the one he's probably most known for. But on this one, he goes north, and he continues to go north, and he goes further north until everything gets icy and cold and frigid and dark, and he just keeps going and going. He goes so far north, he discovers places in the northern parts of Europe that seemingly no one had ever discovered before, like the island of Spitsbergen, now part of Finland, I believe? Norway. Now part of Norway. And Hudson's a very smart guy. He realizes... Hey, if I don't find a northern passage, I have to find something to bring back to the investors so that they keep hiring me to do this. So off of the island of Spitsbergen, they actually found whales. And so Henry Hudson, oh, wait a minute, there's a whole bunch of whales here. So he could bring that information back to the Muscovy Company and start essentially a whaling industry there, which is exactly what happened. So he's responsible for the discovery of those islands and the whaling industry off the coast. And Hudson even goes a little further north from there. And I'm assuming, just because this seems to happen on every single expedition he leads... His crew starts to murmur and gossip amongst themselves and talk about mutinying. Mutinying? Mutinying. I don't know how to say it. You know the word I'm talking about. They, they're threatening to have a mutiny. 
And this tends to happen to Hudson because he's so forward thinking. And no matter what happens, he always wants to press forward. But as you can imagine, the ice crumbling in around you and things getting colder and the nights getting shorter and you're getting further and further away. And every mile out you go, you know, you have to go back that extra mile. So eventually, Henry Hudson says, I can't go any further north. I'm going to be locked in by ice. And that's, this is going to be the point where he turns around. But he came within like 600 miles of reaching the North Pole, which is pretty good considering he was in a boat and the North Pole is frozen over and, you know, you can stand on it. So quite remarkable, actually. And at that time, it was a record. He had the world record. There was no one keeping track of that kind of stuff. But he had the record for the moment. He came the closest of anyone ever up till that point. And it would be a while before anyone broke that record. And finally, he helped answer a scientific question. He said, well, once you get to this point, you're going to see pretty much solid ice. So if there is a, a liquid core or a liquid ocean at the top of the world, it's not until such and such of mark, if ever at all. Henry Hudson gets a second voyage from the Muscovy Company with some funding from another company. And he ends up going to look for the North East Passage. So now he's going to try to go over what is now Russia and find a way to the Far East that way. On both of these first two missions, he seems to be retracing the steps of a Dutch explorer who went out a decade before him named William Barents. Hudson must have known that William Barents also died trying to find the Northeast Passage. And Hudson was going to head in the same exact direction. One has to wonder if Henry Hudson only had the maps of where... Willem went, or whether or not he had the actual logs and understood the conditions he was about to run into. At one point, Barents, about a decade before this, runs into an island, which they're going to name Nova Zembla. It's, it's right above Russia. You can still find it on a map today. And it's described as just this wasteland, frozen solid. And the only animals they really can find on the island are polar bears. So, as you can imagine, it just it looks like a Star Wars planet or something. Everywhere you look around you is ice and half-frozen water, and cold winds, and the only animals you can see are huge polar bears that want to kill you and eat you, and they get stuck in the ice, and they get stuck on this island until spring comes, and they can get their way out. They end up building a makeshift shelter and hunting polar bears, basically, to uh, subsist. Could you imagine trying to hunt a polar bear with a sharpened boat oar or something, or a very, very primitive gun? Not a good time. So as Hudson was heading into this, if he knew about what he was heading towards, he, he was indeed a very brave man. And if he didn't know, well, he was about to find out. We don't have the log from some of Hudson's expeditions, but we do from this one. And so I'm going to read from it just to give you a sense of what was going on through his own eyes, because he wrote this one. Some of the other ones were written by other people, but this one he wrote. And get a sense of how things are becoming a little scary and how the mind's getting a little foggy as vitamin deficiencies are obviously kicking in. So we're going to see some mythological characters show up. All right. And so you don't have to listen to me. And I'll, uh, I'll even bring down my voice a little bit so it sounds kind of spooky and ethereal. June 8th. From midnight last night until noon today, we figured that by various headings, our general course was north by east. Our latitude was 74 degrees, 38 minutes. And there was no bottom at 200 fathoms. In the afternoon, the wind came out of the south-southeast, and the southeast by east. Throughout the day and the night, we had clear weather, and we are now entering into a black blue sea. June 9th. Clear weather with a wind southwest by east. From yesterday until noon today, we steered northeast with no trouble. Then we encountered ice. It was the first ice we had seen on this voyage, and entered hoping to pass through it. We held our course between north and northeast, until four in the afternoon, heading up one ice flow and giving room for another. By this time, we were so far in, 12 to 15 miles, and the ice was so thick and firm ahead that we had endangered ourselves. We returned the way we had entered, suffering only a few rubs of our ship against the ice. By eight o'clock this evening, we got free of it. Until noon the next day, we steered southwest and south for 54 miles. Soundings taken on midway showed we had no ground at 180 fathoms. June 15th. All day and throughout the night, there was a clear sunshine and the wind out of the east. Latitude at noon is 75 degrees, 7 minutes. By our account, we sailed westward 39 miles. In the afternoon, the sea calmed. With an east wind, we set up sail, heading south by east and south. Southeast. 
This morning, one of our crew, while looking overboard, saw a mermaid, calling the rest of the crew to come and see her. One more came up, and by the time she was close to the ship's side and looking earnestly at the men, a little after a sea came up and overturned her. As they saw her from the navel upwards, her back and breasts were like that of a woman's. Her body was as big as ours, her skin very white, and she had long black hair hanging down behind her. In her going down, they saw her tail, which was like the tail of a porpoise, and speckled like that of a mackerel. Thomas Hiles and Robert Rayner were the men who saw her. June 20th. Fair warm weather today. At 4 o'clock this morning, we had the soundings at 125 fathoms. Here we heard bears roaring on the ice, and there were an incredible number of seals. We had soundings at 115 fathoms, and later 95 fathoms, with the bottom of sandy mud. We had the sun on the meridian north by east, and half a point easterly. Its height was 7 degrees 20 minutes, from 12 o'clock last night until 12 o'clock this night. We had made 36 miles to the southeast by south, and 10 and a half miles southeast. The ice always being off to our port. The wind today was being north and northwest. June 30th, calm, hot, and fair weather. We weighed anchor in the morning, and by rowing and towing, came to anchor at noon near the previously mentioned island in the mouth of the river. Very much ice was being driven out to sea about six miles from us. It was being driven towards the northwest so fast that by midnight we could not see from the lookout. At the island where we were anchored lies a small rock, covered with 40 or 50 sleeping walruses, it being so small that this was all it could hold. I sent the crew ashore to kill them, leaving no one aboard except my boy and myself. But they were so near the water, all got away except one, which they killed and brought his head back. August 7th, I used all diligence to arrive at London, and therefore I now give my crew a certificate under my hand of my free and willing return without persuasion or force by any one or more of them. For when we were at Nova Zembla on the 6th of July, void of all hope of finding the Northeast Passage. I jumped around a little bit in reading this travel log just to give you some of the uh, more interesting highlights. The first thing you must be saying to yourself, is a mermaid? Really? They saw a mermaid. Well, he notes the two guys who did see a mermaid as if to say, well, I didn't see this, but let me just let you guys know. People believed in mermaids at the time. And there's a lot of theories on to how that happened. Of course, people could have mistaken seals or different types of whales or dolphins as mermaids. And then, of course, sailors out at sea for weeks and months at a time. Maybe the uh, bright ice messes with their eyes. Their nutrition starts to go. They start to get scurvy and other sorts of vitamin deficient diseases. They start seeing things. They, they start seeing mirages, basically. And so that's probably what was going on there because not too many people have run into mermaids recently. And then you might say to yourself, wait, why did Hudson bring back the head of a seal? Why, why do that? Why keep that thing on your boat? Wouldn't that be creepy? Well, he wanted to prove to the investors who funded this mission that, hey, look, there are seals at this location. And so Hudson's going to actually begin the seal industry up near Nova Zembla, for the English anyway. Just like he did previously with uh, Spitsbergen island and that's been debated back and forth but he certainly was the first one to note the uh whales off the coast of spitzbergen so again he's always looking for a way to like okay i failed i didn't find my way to asia but i found this industry that we can tap into he's a very smart man and at the very end of this log for his second mission his second expedition he vows to find the northwest passage but something happens after this point because once he gets back to london all of a sudden he's not getting hired again the company's not interested in him anymore. And for one reason or another, it seems that he can't get work anywhere in England. There's been some kind of falling out. For some reason, they no longer value Henry Hudson. Now, Henry Hudson's a very confident man, and he knows, I'm worth something. I got good ideas. I've done my research. If you don't want to hire me, I'll find somebody who will. So this is a little life lesson for you guys. All right, If somebody kicks you to the curb, you go out there. You find somebody else to work for, you work for yourself, and then you come back and you outdo the guy who kicked you to the curb the first time. So within a year, we find that Henry Hudson is making contracts with the Dutch. Hudson seemed to have spent a couple months in the Netherlands gathering information for his next expedition. He met a lot of the most famous map makers in the world, and probably had some information from English maps that were kept secret, combined with information that he was now being fed by the Dutch. You might be saying to yourself, well, why have secret maps? It's the Earth. 
It's, it's everywhere. How can you keep that a secret? Well, at this time, a lot of it was a secret. So, and there, it could be quite advantageous to have those secrets to yourself. To give you some examples, the Spanish and the Portuguese, they took over mass amounts of Central and South America and plundered all the gold and silver from it before anybody else could really get to it. Similarly, we just learned about Henry Hudson. He found new markets way up north where there's seals and whales. He found them before anybody else could, and the country he was working for benefited from it. So if you had a map of a part of the earth that hadn't really been explored very much by your competitors, you didn't tell anybody about it. That was your secret. But now here we have this guy, Henry Hudson, who has both the maps of the English companies he's worked for, and now he has access to the Dutch maps. He probably has a more clear picture of the New World and the, the Arctic than anyone at this time. Probably without a doubt anyone at this time. And the experience that nobody alive would have had of having been to a lot of these places. The author Douglas Hudson says just that. Because Hudson was privy to the inner circles of both Dutch and English navigation, he may have been the most knowledgeable man on the planet as to the geography of the Arctic and Atlantic worlds. So Hudson found himself negotiating with the VOC, which we covered in our Who Were the Dutch episode. So the VOC is going to be the Dutch East India Company, and they're going to be one of the largest companies ever, by far. You can adjust it for inflation and, and take in consideration the time, but I believe the figure I quoted in the episode is, if that company existed today, it'd be worth $8 trillion, which is way more than any other company you're going to come by or you can think of. So why was the Dutch East India Company interested in Henry Hudson all of a sudden, this Englishman? Well, it turns out the Dutch East India Company wants to find the Northeast Passage. The one that Henry Hudson just knew doesn't exist, at least not at that time. And the one that Willem Barents died tried trying to find a decade before. Henry Hudson knew there was no Northeast Passage. But Henry Hudson is trying to keep that on the down low because he's going to take the contract. As he negotiates with the Dutch East India Company, he has a lot of his map-making friends in the Netherlands negotiate for him, because there's a bit of a language barrier there. Henry Hudson is learning the language, but if you have a friend who's fluent in the language, well, it's a lot better that that person negotiate for you. And these map-makers that he became friends with, they had to know what he was up to. They had to realize, based on his previous expeditions, what the Northeast looked like, and had to realize, well, there were some opportunities in the Northwest, possibly, in uncharted territory. And the writer, Douglas Hunter, he points out that the VOC didn't really think there was a Northeast Passage. They thought there was a very small chance. Because they did have the record logs of Willem, Willem Barrett's, and they knew about Henry Hudson's other two expeditions. But they thought, hey, if there's a chance there's a passage up there, well, it's better that we find it, not somebody else. And so Hudson actually worked on the cheap. Compared to some of the missions that were being sent to the far, far east, and in places that we would now call the uh, Indonesia or... Uh, Southeast Asia, Hudson worked for basically nothing. Also, not too long after Hudson leaves, there's a truce signed between the Dutch and Spain, which we talk about in our Dutch episode. And so there's really no need to find a northeast passageway because now there's even less threat going south and around the Horn of Africa. But somehow word got back to the VOC that Hudson might have been planning something else to do on the company dime. Because in the 1609 contract that Hudson makes with the VOC, there's an amendment. So they made the contract, and then they added something a couple days later. I believe it was a couple days later. They added something on the end there. Just as kind of a way to, like, wag their finger at Henry Hudson. And it said, Think of discovering no other route or passage except the route around the north or northeast above Nova Zembla. And Hudson said, All right, all right, I get you, I get you. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go northeast. Yeah, sure. Uh, just give me the boat, we'll get our guys together, yeah, I'll do what you said. So Hudson gets the legendary half moon, at least that's what we call it in English, and he starts heading north. It looks like he's gonna go back to that northeast passage, he's gonna try to find it. And then suddenly he makes a left turn and starts heading west. And there's no written account as to why that happens. I wonder why they're all hush-hush about it. On this particular expedition, we have one account, it's the uh, journal of, what's his name, Robert Jewett. I believe that's how you say his name. And the reason why they just started heading west? Nothing given. It's completely blank. You'd think this very important decision would have some explanation along with it. But everyone is very hush-hush about this. But between you and me, we know exactly why he was going to the northwest instead of the northeast. He's looking for the northwest passage. 
So why go after the Northwest Passage finally? What what convinced him to do so? What did he see in these maps and these records that gave him a hint that maybe this is the way to the Orient? We remember very early on Verrazano came across the area we now call the Hudson River and the Delaware and basically the Mid-Atlantic states and said there might be a channel cutting straight through the middle of this North American continent. This might be the way through. And the Spanish and the Portuguese, they demonstrated that there's no other way to get past the Americas unless you go around the bottom of South America. And you're pretty close to Antarctica at that point, which hadn't been discovered yet, but completely out of the way. So that takes all the southern latitudes out of the equation, takes out the equator, that whole area, the tropics, brings you all the way up the east coast. Then you have a bunch of English sailors, which Hudson might have known about or even... Geez, he would have probably have been a young man when these guys set sail. He could have been on these boats. We don't exactly know who were on all these missions. But Martin Frobisher, John Bovis, they, they went to the extreme northern parts of the globe looking for a northwest passage way far north, and they couldn't find anything. They got locked in ice and came back all disappointed. So Hudson knew, wait a minute. Okay, can't go south, can't cut through the middle. A lot of the uh, low latitudes up the North American coastline, that's not going to work. And then if I go really far north, that's not going to work either. So the only viable, possible way that there could be a Northwest Passage at this point, Hudson knew, would be through this mid-Atlantic latitude, somewhere between what we would now call, you know, north of Virginia and then south of Nova Scotia. There must be a way in somewhere. If there is a way at all, it's got to be in there because everything else has been kind of ruled out by this point. Hudson probably being the only one who possessed all these little pieces of information, was able to deduce that the way through has to be there or it doesn't exist at all. The English and the French receiving some vague descriptions from Native Americans made rough maps and estimates of what the area that Hudson was going to explore would have looked like. So Hudson actually had kind of an idea of what he was going to find already because there had actually been Europeans in the area previously. So between French sources and English sources, the Native Americans seem to describe that there's a number of navigable rivers in what we would now call New York State. And then at a certain point, those rivers connect to very large lakes or very large oceans. Who knows? Huge bodies of water with waves and whatnot. And so this was the hope. This is what Hudson was zeroing in on. He realized, okay, there could be a channel straight through the North American continent that kind of splits the continent in two. Maybe North America narrows in the middle and opens up eventually into Asia. We know that now to not be true. But at the time, that was the best guess of what was going on based on the Native American descriptions and descriptions from people from Jamestown, the English colony of Jamestown. People there were saying, you know, I think there's a Northwest Passage just a little bit north of here. So fellow Englishmen were saying, I think it's pretty close by. And of course, that could have been hype just to get people to move to Jamestown. In fact, just a year or two before Hudson set sail, there's an Englishman named George Weymouth, who Hudson must have been aware of, or he probably knew the guy. He made it all the way to Maine, and Weymouth looked around and said, you know, there's probably a way. All these rivers seem to cut in pretty deep, and there seems to be a lot of, a lot of uh, western water up ahead of me here. So maybe everything just kind of curves in, and there's a way through. So even he, at 1605, was thinking, oh man, I must be pretty close to this. And we know now that, that even John Smith, the famous John Smith from Jamestown, with the whole Pocahontas affair and everything, which isn't exactly accurate, probably the way you learned it, but we're not going to get to that right now. John Smith was sending Henry Hudson maps. So Hudson had the best, most accurate information at the time, and it said, you know what, if there is a Northwest Passage, it's going to be right here. And so that's exactly where Henry Hudson was intending to go. Even though he told the Dutch he wasn't, he knows there's no Northeast Passage. He's going to go find the Northwest Passage. And he's going to do it on the Dutch dime. So now Hudson's going to head due west. Now remember, at, the t at this time, there's no Google Maps. There's no map quest. They don't have a, a big book of complete atlases of every section of the world and everything else. There's no way to know exactly where you are unless you have the right tools and you take the right measurements. So how did sailors at this time find out anything about where they were in the world. First, let's ask, how did they measure speed? Never mind direction, let's just see if they can measure speed. What they would actually use is a uh, coiled rope with knots in it, and that's how they would measure speed. This is where we get the term knots, when you hear about knots in sailing. This coiled rope would have knots in it at certain intervals, really depended on what you had your setup for. It could be a knot at every mile, half mile, tenth a mile, doesn't really matter in this case. And you would have an hourglass 
that was set to expire in one hour, let's say. So you got your one hour hourglass, and then you threw out your rope with a weight on it, and then you would see how many knots you would lose over the course of that hourglass time. So you lost five knots in one hour. So now you know you did five knots an hour. That's how you would measure speed. And then you'd have to crank that thing in. So that would you'd probably develop some pretty strong forearms measuring your speed every now and then. But that would only give you a rough estimate of speed. It would give you no sense of direction whatsoever. Latitude or longitude or your, your moving direction. Just speed. For latitude, just knowing a little bit of math, you could figure that out. So depending on the time of the year, the exact date, you would wait until high noon, and then measure the height of the sun in, in the sky in terms of degrees. So if it was straight over your head, it'd be 90 degrees. You know, if it was at the halfway point, it'd be about 45 degrees. So knowing your degree, knowing that it's high noon, and knowing what the date of the year was, you could calculate your latitude. Your latitude, of course, is how far north of the equator are you, or south of the equator. So the equator is going to be zero degrees latitude, and then the North Pole will be 90 degrees north latitude. So Hudson was able to measure speed, and he was able to measure latitude. But longitude, that perfect measurement that would tell you exactly where you are, because if you have your longitude and your latitude, you know exactly where you are on the surface of the Earth, as long as you're on the surface. The Dutch hadn't figured that out yet. Nor had the English or anybody else. They haven't figured out how to measure longitude yet. But it would only be a couple years, like a handful, less than 10, before people started to really come up with workable methods for doing that. So, basically, you knew where you were north and south, but as far as east and west, you had to hope that your keeping of knots was accurate. And, of course, it's always off by a little bit, so after weeks and weeks of adding these knots together, you're going to be off by quite a bit. And that's a big reason why the maps before, you know, 1650 or so all look really distorted compared to the maps we see today. There's other reasons, but that's a big part of the reason, is that you really don't know your east to west so much as your north to south. That's how measurements got done. Hudson's Half Moon, well, it was a good ship. It, it, was, uh, it, didn't, it wasn't any bigger than it needed to be, and it was pretty fast for the time. At most, it could probably go about 100 miles in a day. And it was a sailboat, so it was powered by the wind. If there was no wind, or the wind was not blowing in the right direction, you would go a lot slower. So you're, this is a time where even the strong European powers and their big ships are all dependent on nature blowing the wind in the right direction for them. So you could go 100 miles in a day, you could go 8 miles in a day. Who knows? Or you could hit an iceberg and crash and die, get stuck in a storm and, you know, turn over and die. It's a crazy time. We know on his way to North America at a certain point, he decided to chase a Spanish or Portuguese ship he saw way off on the horizon, but the ship got away. Privateering was a serious business at the time, and it's going to be in the, in the future of this timeline also. If Hudson can pick up a ship full of gold or silver, wow, you know, that's going to make the investors really happy, and, you know, you might tuck a couple coins away for yourself, who knows. When Hudson gets to the coast of Labrador which is now part of Canada, he goes ashore and he salts cod on the shore. Here's another dirty little secret from history. People from Europe have been salting cod off the shore of Labrador for a long time at this point. In fact, there's evidence that sailors and fishermen knew about Labrador in North America and, and the areas around it before Columbus even set sail. So the, again, this is one of those little secrets where Europeans knew about North America and they weren't telling anybody. Because, hey, I'm a sailor and I'm a fisherman and I could fill my ship with dried out salted cod, bring it into harbor in Portugal or England or wherever, sell it for tons of money, and then go back and do it again because there's nobody else out there fishing and taking it all away from me. So, yeah, Europeans knew about North America before Columbus came around. And one of the areas they knew about was Labrador and the cod that was there. It was a huge industry. So Hudson and his crew of 16 take this as an opportunity to replenish their supplies because who knows where this is going to take them. If they can make it to Asia this way, it's going to be a long trip. They're going to need provisions. And just in case you don't believe me about this European contact thing, when Hudson landed off the coast of Labrador and later he, he stopped off in Maine, which of course wasn't called Maine yet, the natives there already knew about Europeans. They already had some European goods. They already knew some European words, perhaps some French words. So anywhere that Hudson shows up and the natives are running to the shoreline with furs, Hudson can be pretty sure, oh, there's been some people here before from Europe. Because as we've learned about with the Native Americans in our Haudenosaunee episodes, Native American furs were very common. They didn't 
they didn't come and welcome other Native Americans with furs. Everybody has furs. That wouldn't make sense. They would come with tobacco and other little small valuable offerings, flint, things you could trade with. Everybody had furs. But when, they, when the Native Americans come to shore with furs on sticks, like, hey, literally swinging the one trading good the Native Americans had for Europeans, you can be sure Europeans had been there before. So we know from Labrador all the way down to Maine, at least, there had already been Europeans there. Henry Hudson was not the first. So having no sense of his longitude, Hudson wanted to make sure that he was exactly where he should be on the map to start looking for that passage, or right, right where he needed to be. So what he's going to do, actually, is he's going to overshoot what is now New York Harbor. He's going to overshoot most of New England and now what we used to call the middle colonies, middle states. And he's going to go right down almost to Jamestown, right to where his friend John Smith lives. Of course, he's in a Dutch boat. So he can't actually go to Jamestown, but he's going to go right outside of it, right before being spotted, just so he knows where exactly he is. Because once he can go, that's Jamestown, or I'm right outside of Jamestown, he knows where on the maps he has he is, and he can start heading north, looking for that elusive Northwest Passage. So barely escaping notice of the English, he heads north along the North American coastline, and he discovers Delaware Bay, and then he comes up into what's going to be New York Harbor. And in New York Harbor, Hudson sails into what essentially is a huge, huge meeting point for different Native American groups. He, he, disco he discovers and, and describes dozens of villages of Native Americans all around Long Island, Manhattan, and the coastlines of what would now be New Jersey, and the inside of New York State. There, there's just tribes everywhere, because New York Bay is just full of fish and, and shellfish and all sorts of good things to eat, and the land not too far inland is good for farming. It's just an amazing place, and it's already full of people. So you think of New York City today as being this hustling, bustling place. Well, 400, 500, 600 years ago, same thing. There were just Native Americans all over the place, belonging to dozens of different, mostly Algonquin groups. So you could probably picture New York City at night and all the lights. Well, picture New York Harbor and all the area around it 600 years ago, and all the campfires you could see on all the shores from all the different tribes, all very close to one another. It's a very different picture than the one we're given of Native American tribes living isolated and very far away from each other and in the wilderness far away. Robert Jewett's journal says the following for when they actually made landfall. Today the people of the country came around seeming glad we had come. They were well dressed in loose deerskins and brought green tobacco which they gave us in exchange for knives and beads. They have yellow copper. They desire clothes and are very civil. They have a great amount of maize and Indian wheat from which they make good bread. The country is full of large, tall oaks. By greeting the Europeans with tobacco instead of furs, that might be an indication that maybe Europeans hadn't really come inside of Hudson Harbor before, or at least hadn't come in a long while, because they came out with the traditional offering you would offer another Native American. Europeans at this time not having much a taste for tobacco. They haven't quite discovered it yet or had the chance to get addicted to it. Before Henry Hudson, of course, goes up the Hudson River, he spent a long time going back and forth and sending out little search parties back and forth to kind of get a sense of what New York Harbor looked like and the northern side of Long Island and the, the whole area with all these craggly little inlets and things like that. He wanted to get a sense of what the opening looked like and who was around and what kind of natives were there and what did they want to trade for. Because again, he's looking for potential markets. If I can't find the Northwest Passage, I better find something to bring back to these people. Robert Jewett's entry for September 6th. It was fair weather in the morning, and our master sent John Coleman with four other men in our boat to the northern side to sound the other river, which was 12 miles from us. Along the way, the water shoaled to two fathoms, but north of the river, there was 18 and 20 fathoms in a good anchorage. There was also a narrow river between two islands to the westward. They told us the land was as pleasant with grass and flowers and handsome trees as they have ever seen, and that very sweet smell came from them. They went six miles, saw an open sea, and returned. On the return, they were attacked by two canoes, one containing twelve, the other fourteen men. The night came and it began to rain, which extinguished the wick of their lamp. One of our men, John Coleman, was slain in a fight by an arrow shot into his throat. The other two were hurt. It grew so dark they could not find the ship that night and had to row back and forth. The current was so strong that their grapnel could not hold them. September 7th. Today was fair. At 10 o'clock, they returned to the ship 
and brought our dead man with them. We carried him ashore, buried him, and named the point after his name, Coleman's Point. Then we hoisted aboard our boat and raised the side of our ship with waste boards for defense of our men. We remained at anchor all night, keeping a careful watch. September 8th. Very fair weather. We remained at anchor and kept very quiet. The people came aboard and brought tobacco and Indian wheat to exchange for knives and beads. They offered us no violence, so we fit the boat up and watched them to see if they would show any sign of the death of our man, which they did not. September 9th. Fair weather. In the morning, two great canoes full of men came aboard, one with bows and arrows, and the other attempt to deceive us, pretending interest in buying knives. But we were aware of their interest and took two of them as prisoners, putting red coats on them and not allowing any others to come near us. They went back to land, and the two others in a canoe came aboard. We took one and let the other go. But the one we had taken got up and leapt overboard. Then we hoisted anchor and went off through the channel of the river, where we re-anchored for the rest of the night. In this description, we can see that Hudson loses a man. The Native Americans have gotten violent. Now Hudson's becoming less trusting, and the Natives are becoming less trusting, and conditions are getting worse, and they're, they're moving around and trying to keep out of people's way. Also in the description, uh, parts that I didn't read, there's lots of copper bits being traded back and forth by the Native Americans. This would seem to confirm what we talked about in one of the Haudenosaunee episodes, that wampum, or suant as the Dutch would call it, was not the medium of exchange among Native Americans on the East Coast so much as little copper spirals. And it seems like only after the Dutch moved in did wampum and the purpose of wampum kind of turn into a semi-currency. So these little copper spirals seem to be the small, lightweight way to exchange value. It's around this point that Hudson decides to start going up the river that will one day have his name attached to it. And you might say to yourself, well, he, if he's looking for the Northwest Passage, why would he go up a river? Wouldn't that only lead to some up, uphill portion of the land that and eventually gets smaller and smaller and landlock you? Well, the Hudson River is kind of strange, and if you're from upstate New York, you might not notice it so much, but if you live in downstate New York or anything around New York City, you would be kind of aware that at the bottom of the Hudson River, there's very little indication that the Hudson River is a river. It might just be a large bay that opens up into another ocean somewhere along the way. It might be a, a channel that just kind of cuts through two chunks of land and opens up far in the distance to another ocean once again, or, or some large body of water. There's not really that much of an indication that the Hudson River is a river until you get really far upstream, which is exactly what Hudson's going to run into. So again, Hudson isn't stupid. He just knows what he knows for the time, the information given to him, the science and whatnot. And there's no indication yet that the Hudson River is just going to be a river. This might be it. This might be the Northwest Passage. Back to Jewett's journal. September 15th, the morning was misty until the sun rose and it cleared. We weighed anchor with the wind from the south ran 60 miles further up the river, passing by high mountains. We saw a great many salmon in the river and had a good depth of 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 13 fathoms. This morning, our two captive savages got out and swam away. After we were under sail, they called to us in scorn. At night, we came to another mountain, which lie along the river's side. There we found a very loving people, and very old men, and we were well taken care of. Our boat went out to fish and caught a great many of very good fish. September 16th, fair and hot weather. In the morning, our boat went out fishing again, but caught only a few on account of their canoes, which had been there all night. This morning, the people came and brought us ears of Indian corn, pumpkins, tobacco, which we bought for trinkets. We remained there all day and filled our casks with fresh water. At night, we went six miles higher up the river, where we had shallow water, so we anchored until day. Jewett is describing, of course, the Catskill Mountains. And then he's probably running into maybe the... Esopus Indians, which the Dutch will have a lot of problems with later on, but I'm not really sure who, which exact native group he runs into. For certain, they're an Algonquin group. They're not going to be the Iroquois, who are much further inland, and we'll get to at a much later time. And again, this far up the Hudson River, the natives are handing out green tobacco. They're not coming to the shore with furs on sticks like we would see in Maine or Nova Scotia. So these people have probably never seen a European before. You can't be 100% sure, because there was always rumors of old French forts being found 
up and down the Hudson River from before Hudson's voyage. But it seems like these natives are seeing Europeans for the first time. There are portions of Hudson's journal that survive. Hudson writes, In latitude 42 degrees, 18 minutes, I sailed to the shore in one of their canoes with an old man who was the chief of, of the tribe consisting of 40 men and 17 women. I saw there a house well constructed of oak bark and circular in shape so that it had the appearance of being well built with an arched roof and contained a great quantity of maize or Indian corn and beans of last year's growth. And there lay in the house for the purpose of drying enough to load three ships besides what was growing in the fields. On our coming into the house, two mats were spread out to sit upon, and immediately some food was served in well-made red wooden bowls. Two men were also dispatched at once with bows and arrows in quest of game, who soon found after brought a pair of pigeons which they had shot. They likewise killed a fat dog and skinned it in great haste with shells which they had gotten out of the water. They supposed that I would remain with them for the night, but I returned after a short time on board the ship. The land is the finest for cultivation that I have ever seen in my life or set foot upon, and also abounds in trees in every description. The natives are a very good people, for which when they saw that I would not remain, they supposed that I was afraid of their bows, and taking the arrows, they broke them into pieces and threw them into the fire. You can hear in Hudson's description the relief from being up in Nova Zembla and fighting polar bears and ice and icebergs and just death all around and freezing frigid temperatures. Being in this nice land with tall trees and wonderful mountains and nice little valleys full of grain to eat and corn and friendly natives this far upstream who just want to feed him and give him, you know, tobacco to smoke and who are willing to break their own weapons and throw it on the fire. There's guys willing to go out and hunt for him. Just the, the relief and the like, wow, you know, I, I really lucked out this time. I'm not in the middle of nowhere now. This is a nice place. And at this latitude, we're not looking at the Usopus anymore. Maybe we are, but we might be coming up on the Mohegan tribe. It's really difficult to discern between these Algonquin tribes who live so close together because culturally and linguistically, they're so close together. But Hudson does seem to describe a large wigwam-like structure rather than a longhouse. So we're assuming this is an Algonquin people. Hudson makes it as far north on the river that will soon be named after him as Albany or maybe Troy, New York. It's difficult to say based on his measurements and the uh, level of accuracy. And then he sent a, a couple guys in a smaller boat up even further and they might have made it as far as Cohoes. And it's really hard to tell. But at a certain point, Hudson realizes, wait a minute, this is a river. It's just gonna get smaller and smaller and that's gonna be it. We're gonna be landlocked. This is not the Northwest Passage. So where I teach right now, actually, I have the Hudson River right outside the uh, window. And not only is it right outside the window, but it's it might possibly be exactly where Hudson decides to turn around and go home. So I'd like to point that out to the kids, that uh, everything north of us, he looked at and said, nah, don't like it. So again, you might say to yourself, how did Hudson not realize when he was, you know, in modern day Albany that this was a river? Well... You know, last year I was down in Kingston, and I was looking at the Hudson River, and the water was actually, it appeared to me on the surface, to be flowing north. So it was flowing away from New York Harbor. This is in Kingston, which is like an hour north of the city. So uh, the Hudson River actually is affected by tides for a very long time. So as Hudson was going up the river, he saw, he might have saw at that time of year, that the waves seemed to have been going north. So as far as he knew, there was a lower elevation up north, and the water was headed in that direction. Like I said before, depending on the conditions, the Hudson River doesn't seem like a river. And you can go as far north as Albany and not quite understand what you're looking at. Again, there's no map quest. In fact, Henry Hudson, by going up the Hudson River, was literally sailing off the known world. There were no maps of where he was at that point. He had sailed past the inlet and had sailed off the map, off the page. He was making the map. He was the map maker in this instance. So quite an, quite an accomplishment, quite amazing. And you can ruminate on it quite a bit to think about the bravery it takes to be like, I don't know where I'm going. There are no maps and I'm just gonna keep going up here and see what happens. You have natives shooting things at you and you're shooting things back at them. Dark nights, storms. You don't know how narrow 
the water is going to get or how shallow it's going to get. You, you could destroy your entire ship and just be stranded on a continent you know nothing about. So, Henry Hudson was not stupid. And then as soon as he realized he was in a river, he decided to turn around and go back home. And you can imagine the disappointment he felt. This being his third outing, and this being the one place left over in his calculations where there could be a Northwest Passage, and he only found a large river that was slowly narrowing. So Hudson decides to turn back and return home. Of course, one thing he has in his diary in Robert Jouett's account that will become useful to the Dutch is he mentions the furs that are there. And so whether he was aware of it or not, he's going to start New Netherland because the only reason New Netherland is going to exist is that the Dutch are going to know about the furs that the natives have there. Imagine in an alternative world if Henry Hudson's third expedition was for the Muscovy Company, for the company he's worked with all along. It's pretty clear Henry Hudson would have headed in the same exact direction. He was pretty dead set on looking for the Northwest Passage, exactly where the Hudson River is. And so you have to wonder, geez, if Henry Hudson found it for the English, none of our upcoming story would have happened. There would have been no New Netherland. The middle colonies, as you probably learned in social studies class, might have just been part of New England or part of the southern colonies. That distinct culture that exists in the middle of our country, the New York City culture, the New York culture, the Philly culture, all that, the, the story would have been completely different. There would have been English people there far sooner, and they would have come from different backgrounds, and who knows? It's part of alternative history. It's, it's something that writers can write about going forward, but you wouldn't see the New York City you see today had Henry Hudson been working for the English. So although Henry Hudson turned back with great disappointment, he had already changed history, and he wasn't even aware of it. So his, his personal failure, the feeling of loss and failure that he had inside of him, history could look back and say, no, Henry Hudson, you didn't find the Northwest Passage, but what you laid down, the pieces, the dominoes you pushed over, are going to cause all sorts of interesting things and amazing things. And Henry Hudson, you did a good job. A later Dutch writer and resident of New Netherland, Adrian van der Donk, he writes about, oh, the natives, the natives in the neighborhood here, they describe seeing Henry Hudson for the first time. And, and oh, the, the ship was so amazing to them. They'd never seen anything like that. And they thought the great spirit was in it and, and the boat was a huge house. Now, Vanderdonk and other Dutch writers and diplomats, they're going to use Hudson's voyage as justification for owning the area. So we'll talk about this, the idea of European land ownership and land claims. But the Dutch were able to say, nope, this area, the Hudson River... The area we call now, we now call New York, New Jersey, parts of Connecticut, parts of Pennsylvania and Delaware. We own this because Henry Hudson was hired by us, and he's the one who first set foot on it. So part of their ownership over the area was to point at Henry Hudson and say, nope, he discovered it first. And so later Dutch writers will come up with these fantastic accounts of how the natives were amazed to see Henry Hudson. Because he was the first European to show up there, and they'd never seen anything like that before. Of course based on the own, their own surviving accounts from this mission, we know that there were natives who had seen Europeans before, especially near the shorelines. But that didn't help the Dutch case to say, I own this land. So on the return journey, we know that Hudson brought some natives back to the old world with him. And I don't think we know exactly what happened to them, what their fate was. Now, there were a lot of diseases in the old world that the new world residents, natives, didn't have much exposure to. So, you know, it's sad, but it's unlikely that these natives survived. We also know that the Half Moon made an unexpected trip to England on its return to the Netherlands, which would be a big no-no for the Dutch East India Company. Because here you have an English sailor, and all of a sudden he's taking a side trip to England. You know, is he going to tell the English about where he went? Is he going to deliver secret maps? There was a lot of speculation about what he was doing there. But it seems that the the British crew, because some of the crew were, were English, simply wanted to be returned back to England directly and not have to go back to the Netherlands and then turn around and uh, end up in England. But here's a Henry Hudson conspiracy. Was he working for the English all along? Well, probably not, because as we're going to see in the uh, upcoming couple of years here, it's not the uh, English who show up around the Hudson Harbor so much as the Dutch. So it's unlikely that English were tipped off right away. We're going to see some people sailing up north from Jamestown to scout out the coast, but they're not looking for furs especially. They're not looking to settle. 
So it seems unlikely that Hudson had this in mind and was smuggling information. Although it is interesting to speculate and it does make for a juicy bit of gossip. When Henry Hudson returns to the Netherlands, as you can imagine, it's not a good time. The company is angry at him, obviously, because he went northwest instead of northeast. Especially after it was amended in his contract that he would go no other way. And then he almost immediately goes another way. Not to mention he stopped over in England. So that's the Netherlands' main competitor. As you can imagine, the Dutch were not too keen to rehire Henry Hudson. So, eventually he gets the boot. He gets paid and everything, but he winds up in the next year back in England. And here, because of all the legends of his exploits, he gets funding from the British East India Company and from the Virginia Company. And they said to him, Henry Hudson, you're going to find the Northwest Passage. I feel it. I feel it on my bones. I think you're onto something here. So Henry Hudson, he went back to his maps and he said, well, where, where is a hole in, in all these expeditions? And now we have a hundred years of, of evidence in information. Where has an explorer not explored yet? So we have the entire, all the Spanish and Portuguese possessions, so all of South America, they know there's no way through Central America, around Florida, all the way up the East Coast. Now, now we have, you know, Delaware River, we have the Hudson River, what is now Connecticut. He knows all of that doesn't contain the Northwest Passage. He knows further up in what's now Massachusetts. Of course, he landed in Maine. He went all the way up to Nova Scotia. And then he referenced earlier explorers who explored the far north. But he, he found one little pocket. One little area left that could possibly hold a Northwest Passage. So on Henry Hudson's fourth voyage, he's going to head for that little pocket way up far in the north. And this story is a little off topic because Hudson's third voyage is when he basically establishes the legal claim for New Netherland. So that's our story. But I'm going to continue on the fourth voyage because it's interesting stuff and I think you should know it. So please listen. On his fourth voyage, he ends up being stuck in the bowl of land that's now called Hudson's Bay. If you look at a map, look look at Canada, look up into the north there, and you'll see that big area of land cut out, like a huge eye. And there's a huge chunk of water there now, named after Henry Hudson. That's where Henry Hudson finally got a boat into. And he figured, this has to be the way to the Northwest Passage. I'm so far into this continent now, and it opens up into this big body of water. Surely, if I just keep going, I'll go over the top of the whole continent and I'll be in the Pacific Ocean, right? Of course, like I said, he's making these maps for the first time. Hudson's Bay is just cut out. It's a big old circle. So he just went around that thing. And if you go around that thing in a boat, you pretty much come out exactly where you went in, especially at this time, with how much of the northern parts of your map that you're probably looking at right now would have been frozen over. So Henry Hudson didn't know it, but as soon as he entered... He was at a dead end. It's like entering a maze, and it's just going to lead you back to where you came from. So, he's exploring Hudson's Bay, which is massive. I, I don't know how big it is exactly, but I don't know, the size of the Midwest? It's huge. And it gets late in the year, and his boat actually just gets frozen in the ice. They're stuck. Him and his crew are stuck in the northern reaches of the planet. This is worse than any of his expeditions to the northeast, to Nova Zembla. His men get sick, they get scurvy, it's freezing cold. You're spending the entire winter waiting to unfreeze on a boat in the middle of a frozen sea. When spring comes and they can finally thaw out the ice and get the boat moving around and they could probably make their way back the way they came and home to safety, Henry Hudson, we know him. It's been four expeditions. Henry Hudson this time does not want to turn around. He is driven to move westward, find the Northwest Passage, be the one. But wouldn't you know it, once again, his crew mutinies. Hudson, his young son, and a couple of his loyalists were put into a shallop, like a large rowboat, and just set adrift in the middle of icy Hudson's Bay. And the rest of the crew took his ship and headed home. This is when we get into another cover-up or conspiracy. The two men who orchestrated the mutiny, who were supposedly the leaders of the mutiny, and so would, you know, face the most severe crimes for it, die on the way home. Of course, many people say, oh, this, this, is, this sounds fishy. So what probably happened is there was a mutiny, and these two guys were either put on the rowboat with Hudson, or they died on the way back, and then they said, you know what, let's blame it all on these two dead guys so we don't get in trouble for being mutineers. Because, of course, the most common um, sentence for being a mutineer is death. So the entire account of the return journey after they dump Hudson in the middle of Hudson's Bay, which wasn't called that at the time, 
is probably fictional. It's probably just a long document invented to make the mutineers look good. Make their reasons look sane. Make their actions look humane. And you could take it to be as truthful as Harry Potter. But we do know when they returned, they didn't receive a mutineer's sentence. Well, let's return to Henry Hudson in that shallop with his young son. What happened after this point? We have no idea. That's the last record of Henry Hudson. It's over. Four expeditions. Again, like I said, born at the beginning of recorded history as far as ordinary people were concerned. We don't know his exact birth date, who his parents were. We don't have an actual portrait of him. We have speculative portraits that artists did much later. Don't know when he was born, who he was born to. We don't know what he looked like. And here we are at the end of his life. We don't know when he died, where he died. If he died, he could still be alive. We don't know. There's nothing. So Henry Hudson, he's, he's a lot like a ghost. He enters our story basically with no known background. And just like that, he leaves our story. After having discovered so many places, opened up so many new industries, and set the course for two or three different empires, at least. Being such a mystery, it's no surprise that in the story of Rip Van Winkle, it's the spectral, ghostly presence of Henry Hudson up in the Catskill Mountains that goes bowling and drinking with Rip Van Winkle before he falls asleep. Does Henry Hudson still stalk North America as a ghost? Or a never-dying man? Or did he freeze to death in the boat? Was he killed by Native Americans? Did he find his way to shore and was adopted by Native Americans? There are no answers. I have nothing to give you. But we do know that in Henry Hudson's time, there was no Northwest Passage. And there was no Northeast Passage. He was looking for something that just wasn't there. Not yet, anyway. Due to global warming, there is now a Northwest Passage that you can take in a boat over the top of Canada. And of course now there's a straight western passage because of the Panama Canal. And then it wouldn't be for about another hundred years until the Russians established a northeast passage. Hudson, a man truly ahead of his time, was searching for something that only existed in the future. I'm Eric Giannis. This has been the Other States of America History Podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening.